We'll now take a look at further examples of applications of the chain rule in related rates, implicit differentiation, or as a chain rule within the bigger um, optimization problem. So our first example here is convergent extension, which is a process by which a block of tissue narrows in one direction and elongates in another direction. So if we start with something rectangular, then it will become a rectangle, but narrower and longer. This process is very well studied in uh, fish and frogs, and that is due to the large embryo size, its transparency, and also its development outside of a uterus. So it's easy to photograph. So as we all know, a frog starts as an egg, which is pretty circular um, in shape, pretty spherical in shape. And then through this process of re jiggling where the actual cells are, it becomes what we know generally as a tadpole. So my daughter has these handy little handouts from her daycare. It starts off as a little egg inside a transparent shell, which is why we can study it fairly well because it can be easily photographed. It then becomes a tadpole, with little eyes, and then finally becomes a little frog. Okay, so it's for some visuals here. We can photograph all of these stages of the development um, and you can see that just over the pretty quick five hours of time, the tissues have reformatted themselves from following a very circular and round pattern to actually build a skeletal element of the future tadpole. Let's take a look at a problem with some numbers. So let's say you start with a rectangular block of tissue, 10 by 10, so actually a square, but with a thickness of one millimeter. And that extends at the rate of one millimeter per day, while the volume stays the same, and also the thickness remains fixed. So this is quite different from the problems we've considered before, and this is particularly um, representative of this process. Think about this. Here, the thickness of the cells did not change in the process, so the epithelial layer did not actually thicken. It simply got different formation of the cells within it. The other thing that happened was the volume never changed throughout this process. The tissues, the tissue did not acquire new cells, it didn't grow, the cells didn't grow themselves, they simply redistributed themselves throughout, okay? And so we're wondering that if it extends, so it grows lengthwise at one millimeter per day, what happens to the width, width of it if the, when the length is at 20 millimeters? So the first thing to do here, as we've discussed before, is if you can draw a picture, do, because it will really lead you to understand the problem better and also to be able to come up with necessarily quantities. So I have a fairly square block to begin with, 10 by 10, and I end up with much narrower but longer block, okay? Let's record what is it that we know what is it that we're given and what it is that we actually want to know. Let's illustrate our picture and see if we can derive the given and wanted information from it. We're given that we start off with dimensions L and W each 10 millimeters. So on this block here, this width and this length are both 10 millimeters to begin with. So this is one of the key pieces of information that we're given. We're also told that the volume remains fixed as does the thickness at one. So the thickness here being one is going to be one throughout, okay? Whereas the, vol the, whereas the width and the length are going to change. So what we are actually given is that width times length times tau is a fixed volume, which means that when width is 10 and length is 10, this whole volume is 100 and it's actually going to stay 100. So this is 100, and because tau is just 1, this is the same as saying that W times L is 100. Excellent. Block extends at the rate of 1 millimeter per day. So it lengthens at 1 millimeter per day. And the units here are helpful, and so is the word rate, because it becomes quickly very clear that we're talking about the derivative here. So the derivative of length with respect to time is one millimeter per day. Great. What else do we have? Well, we would like to know at what rate is the width changing? 
So what we're after is actually the derivative of the width. And we would like to know how fast it's changing when the length is 20. So when L is 20. Great, looks like we have everything. Now let's take a look at all these things together. So what we want and some of the pieces of information that we have are in terms of derivatives with respect to time. Um, and there are also quantities that are length and width which means that we need to come up with the relationship between length and width. So then we can take a derivative of with respect to time. Luckily, this relationship is also given. It's the volume that stays constant throughout. So I'm going to start with W times L equals 100. And I'm going to take a derivative of this relationship with respect to time. Okay, so notice here that on the left-hand side, we have a product of two things. So we're gonna have to apply the product rule. The product rule says I take a derivative of the first thing, leave the second alone, plus, whoops, leave the first thing, take the derivative of the second, and the derivative of 100, of course, is just zero because it's a constant. Okay, now I can plug things in that I know into here and then hopefully be able to solve for the quantity that I'm after. I'm after dw by dt. I know that length is 20. So this quantity is 20. I also know that dl by dt is one. So I can plug this into here. What I don't yet know though is w and it's not given to me here explicitly. So the question here is, what is w? And I can then again use this relationship to figure out what w is. I know that I want to compute when L is equal to 20. So what does W equal to when L is 20? Well, L times W is 100. So when L is 20, I have a little equation that I can solve for W. W comes out to be five. And that is what I can plug into my equation here. Once I have all of these numbers in place, what do I have? I have that dw by dl by dt turns out to be minus one quarter or 0.25 if you prefer decimals. Everything else is in decimals. I might as well keep them in decimals. And of course, our dimensions were millimeters and the time was per day. Okay, so notice that in this problem, we had to do this extra step of figuring out what was actually given to us, but not yet calculated for us explicitly. Um, as in all word problems, it is usually a good idea to look back and think about, does this answer make sense or is it completely out of bounds? So one of the things to notice here, of course, is that it's negative. Does that make sense that it's negative? Well, what happened here on the picture? This is width, this is length. So length was getting larger and that was also uh, clear from the fact that it was a positive rate of change at one millimeter per day. But if the volume is to say the same, that while it lengthens, it has to shrink widthwise. So the width was actually getting smaller and smaller. So not only are we okay with the negative answer, we really should be expecting something like this. And if you come up with an answer that is positive, then you know you have an issue here. So I'm going to note that negative because it's decreasing. And that is in line with what is actually happening throughout the process. Let's now take a look at an optimization problem that will, will have to employ a chain rule inside of in order to actually figure out the critical points and um, the global extrema. So the question here is, do dogs know calculus? We've already seen that pretty much bees know calculus and crows know calculus. So hopefully dogs are not far behind. This is from the study that a Michigan professor, Tim, actually did perform on his dog, Elvis. Elvis is a little corgi. And Tim noticed that when he takes Elvis to the beach and throws the ball into the water, Elvis seems to follow the same route or close to the same route every single time. He decides to jump into the water at approximately the same spot every time. So Tim wondered why that's the case. Let's think about the situation in general. So what we have is um, a beach. So on top of it is water, on the bottom is the sand. And so what I have is Tim standing here. Whoops. Just like any good dog that plays fetch, what happens is Tim throws the ball 
Elvis retrieves the ball. So let's say this is the ball here and brings it back to Tim. So we can assume that the initial position of Elvis is close to his owner. This is not the dog like mine. He does not bring the ball back. So what are Elvis's choices to go from Tim to the ball? So let's say this is Elvis to start off with. Well, Elvis can jump into the water and swim directly to the ball. So this is one potential route. Or maybe if uh, Elvis really does not like swimming, he will run along the shore as long as possible and then go up directly to the ball. Or of course, Elvis can run some amount of um, distance along the shore and then jump into the water and swim um, sort of diagonally, okay? so. Depending on what Elvis objective is, he might follow different routes. So out of all the paths that we drew, the path that minimizes the distance, the physical distance to the ball, of course, is the direct route here. So the red one, the path that minimizes time in water, and that is if Elvis really tries to avoid actually swimming, then it's this right angle triangle that is in blue. The path that minimizes time to get to the ball is probably somewhere in between. And this is likely what Elvis is trying to get to, right? He's trying to retrieve the ball as fast as possible in the minimum amount of time. Now, being the corgi, he's actually much faster at running than he is at swimming. And so this is probably something that has to factor into his internal calculations about where to jump into the water to get the ball. So just, we can do this with constants, but I didn't want to carry over constants throughout the entire problem. So I simply assigned some numbers to this problem here so we can deal with numbers and not variables. Uh, these are probably an over approximation of how fast Elvis can swim and run, but let's suppose that Elvis runs at seven feet per second and he swims quite a bit slower at one feet per second. We would like to find Elvis's route that minimizes time to ball. If Tim throws the ball 15 feet along, along the shoreline and 20 feet into the water. So we know the exact location of the ball from the Tim's perspective. And we're wondering with that in mind, where will Elvis enter the water? Of course, we're gonna to have to sketch a picture here because this information is hard to keep in mind. Maybe pause the video for a second and see if you can um, sketch the picture and label it with the quantities known already or given in the problem rather. Let's assume that the picture is going to be similar to the previous one where Tim is on the left and he throws the ball to the right side of him. So take a second, try to sketch it. Okay, so your picture should look something like this. Um, Tim starts off, he's sta staying put, Elvis enters the water somewhere here, and what we know is that the ball is 20 feet into the water, and the distance between the Tim and the ball along the shoreline is 15 feet. I know mine is not really up to scale, it doesn't matter, it's just a sketch, so the fact that my 20 looks smaller than my 15 is okay. Now, what we're asked is where does Elvis enter the water? Okay, so where is this point along this 15 feet distance? Is it one foot in, two feet in, or whatever, right? So what becomes clear is that we have to label one of these as our variable, let's call it X. And it is completely up to you which one to label with X. If this is X, then we can figure out what this distance is or the other way around. But one of them will be easier to calculate with. So. Um, we need to figure out what Elvis's route will be. So we'll need to figure out this length in particular. And that means that we will have to figure out what this diagonal length is. In this case, we're going to have to employ the Pythagoras theorem and include both sides of this triangle. So it's likely better if this side of it has a simple expression. So I'm going to call this X right here. Now, if this is X, this whole thing was 15. So that leaves me 15 minus X here. And then this length right here, again, using the Pythagorean theorem, we can see that this is a right angle triangle. So using um, the length for the hypotenuse, this is gonna be square root of 20 squared plus X squared, okay? So now that we have all of our things labeled and figured out, Let's take a look at what is it that we're actually trying to maximize and try to write that down in terms of our variables. So we would like to minimize 
time to get to the ball. Now, none of the things that we have labels for or information about is actually time. We have either distances or velocities or speeds. But that's okay because there's a well-known relationship between time, velocity, and speed. And we're going to use this relationship to take what we have and turn it into the function that we'd like to have. So the total amount of time, let's denote it by capital T, is of course split into two pieces. There is the time that Elvis runs on land, and then there's time that Elvis swims through the water. Remember, the time is distance divided by speed. The distance on land is 15 minus x, and the speed on land is given to us as seven feet per second, plus time in water is distance in water, which was this distance right here given by this ugly expression. So square root of 20 squared plus x squared over the speed in water, which was one foot per second, okay? So this is the expression that we're trying to minimize on our domain. What is the smallest and the biggest that our variable can be? Our variable here is x. What is the smallest x can be? Well, x can be zero, which will mean that Elvis ran all the way to the ball and then swam. So zero is the smallest we can have. And the largest we can have, of course, is if this point is actually right at Tim, which means that Elvis jumped directly into the water and swam directly to the ball. So between zero and 15. This is great news because now all this is is just an optimization problem to find global maximum or rather minimum because we're trying to minimize the time, right? So this is my function, this is my domain. I'm going to take a derivative, look for critical points and let's see what method um, is probably easiest to apply here. So if this is my function, let's rewrite this here. Here I've rewritten that as I've split up this first function into two because one of them turns out to be a constant and one becomes um, still dependent on x. Let's take a derivative of it by hand here so we can see where chain rule actually gets applied. So the derivative of 15 sevenths is just zero. The derivative of minus x over seven, it's kind of uh, easy but it's tricky because it's a little vague. So here, you don't have to apply the quotient rule. You just have to recognize that this guy is just minus one seventh times x. So you can apply the constant rule. The derivative of say three x is just three. So the derivative of minus one seventh times x is just minus one seventh. Plus the derivative of this guy right here. Now this is x squared plus 400 all to power one half. So this is where we will employ the chain rule. The power comes down, you have the inside to reduce power, so minus one half times the derivative of the inside, which in this case is x squared plus 400, so the derivative of that is 2x. Simplifying this, we can uh, see how, for example, these twos will cancel, and we can um, rewrite this as a square root on the bottom, doing common denominators, which I encourage you to do fully by hand, we will get, okay, so this is our derivative. Let's now think about critical points. So the derivative is zero and the derivative does not exist, our two cases. So in this case, the whole point behind putting this together into one big fraction is just so we can analyze it as a top and bottom separately. So the derivative is zero when the top of that fraction is zero and it does not exist when the bottom is zero. If we solve for the top here being zero, you will find out that you have two solutions, uh, plus or minus 2.9 meters. Now, of course, minus 2.9 meters makes no sense. So we will only take one critical point and that is X being, it's approximately 2.9 meters. The denominator being zero, we'll notice here that it's x squared plus something. So no matter what I plug in, the number will come out being positive plus 400. So the denominator being zero produces no solutions here. Now, once you have your critical points, in this case, we only have one. As usual, there is a number of ways to proceed. You can plug this critical point together with endpoints back into the function itself and figure out which one gives you the smallest number. 
um, you can do the first derivative test where you can figure out whether the function is increasing or decreasing, um, or you can do the second derivative test. I'm going to do the second derivative test in this case, um, just to show you how this would work. But the second derivative will come out to be 400 divided by x squared plus 400 to power 3 halves. And recall the second derivative test. Um, the second derivative tells us about a concavity. So notice here, it's x squared. So no matter what I plug in, it's going to get squared and therefore be positive. It then gets added to 400, staying positive, and 400 divided by it. So this expression will always be bigger than zero, which means that the function is always concave up concave up function means that the only way the critical point can occur is at the bottom of it. So that means that what we have is actually a global minimum. So what that actually means on our little sketch here is that Elvis enters the water when X is 2.9 meters because that will actually minimize the time to ball. This is 2.9 meters, which of course then means that this is 12.1. So they can make 15 or meters feet, sorry, they were feet. Um, all together. So now we can say that if the ball was 20 meters into the water and 15 feet along the shoreline, then Elvis will enter the water approximately 12 feet away from Tim. Now the shocking thing, of course, is when Tim went and collected this data by throwing ball into the water um, and, you know, approximating the distance where the ball landed and seeing where Elvis entered the water, he found out that Elvis does indeed generally follow the pattern that will simply minimize the amount of time to the ball. Of course, he didn't discover this on the first try, but as they went to the beach every single day, Elvis figured out when the approximate entry point has to be. So the conclusion here, of course, as before, is the fact that dogs too know calculus. As you might have already noticed, the problems in the related rates and implicit differentiation section essentially fall into one of two groups. The ones where the formula to you is given and the ones where a setup is required. The previous question about Elvis the dog required setup, this one has a specific functional formula that we can use to go through the required exercises. So here we have a curve whose equation is given by this particular formula. y squared is equal to x cubed plus x squared. This is similar to a very famous function called the folium of Descartes, folium meaning a leaf, Descartes being the same person that the Cartesian plane is actually named after. And the reason this curve is so famous is because in 1638, 1638, so think about that, nearly 400 years ago, René Descartes actually challenged Pierre de Fermat, another very famous mathematician, to find a tangent to this curve at any point, because Fermat has claimed to have recently discovered a method for finding tangent lines. And these types of mathematical uh, battle of wits was very popular at the time. Fermat actually solved the problem easily because he could, in fact, find tangent lines, and Descartes was at that point unable to do so. So now we're going to go through the same ideas as Descartes challenged Fermat to actually go through and Fermat, uh, Fermat persevered. So we are first asked to find y prime, a derivative of this function at any arbitrary point. Now notice that the function is given to me as y squared. So I have two choices. I can either solve this explicitly for y, which will result in plus or minus square root 2, the two different branches. And we will notice that, of course, as drawn, this is not actually a function because it does not pass a vertical line test. So solving explicitly for y will divide the curve into the upper half and the lower half, the positive one and the negative one. However, knowing that we can now do implicit differentiation, we can also just take the derivative directly without having to go through more of the algebra. So for the first part of this question, we're going to start with our function as written. y squared is equal to x cubed plus x squared. And we're going to take a derivative of that directly, remembering the implicit differentiation and the chain rule. So on the left-hand side, if I take a derivative, first I notice that I have a power of 2. So my first thing to apply is going to be the power rule. 
However, then I notice that y, of course, is a function of x. So I've dealt with the outside function, but I have not yet dealt with the inside. So I must follow this with the derivative of the inside, which implicitly and not explicitly is equal to y prime. On the right hand side, I have everything in terms of x. So taking derivatives here is going to be straightforward. There is no uh, specific inside to these functions anymore. They're just x's. You can think of the derivative of x as just one. And so here, the application of the power rule is going to be the only thing that we need to go through. Once I have this expression, remember that I'm after y prime, so I simply need to solve this for y prime. So from here, using some simple um, isolating of the y prime and dividing both sides by 2y, I'm going to get 3x squared plus 2x all over 2y as my expression for y prime. And we're done with the first part of our question. This is the expression for the derivative of our function at any point x and y. Now notice, of course, that I still have both of the x and the y in the expression, but that is totally fine. Let's go back to the question and see what we need to do next. Next, we're asked to determine the x-coordinates of all the points where this curve has a horizontal tangent. And the next part is going to ask us the exact same thing, but regarding the vertical tangent. So let's think first about how we can translate these um, words into mathematical concepts. The derivative, of course, remember, gives us the slope of the tangent line at any specified point. Horizontal tangent means the slope of the line has to be zero. So this would correspond to my derivative being zero. And vertical tangent will correspond to the slope being undefined. So that is something that we're going to have to go through. The derivative does not exist or undefined, equaling to infinity. So let's see how we can now use the expression we just derived for our derivative to, in fact, find those points. So once again, horizontal tangent means the slope of the um, tangent line is zero, so the derivative is equal to zero. This is my expression for the derivative. When is this ever going to be zero? Well, a fraction is zero when the top of it is zero. So that implies that I simply need to look at when the top of my expression is equal to zero. And now I only have x as a variable, so this should be fairly straightforward to solve. I can factor x out, and what am I going to have left? 3x plus 2, and that's equal to 0. And the reason that this is good, of course, is because if a product is equal to 0, it means that one of the parts must equal to 0. So either I have that x is equal to 0, or from this bracket, if I solve for x, I will get that x is equal to negative 2 over 3. Okay, so let's now take a look at how these two solutions correspond to the slope of the tangent. Remember, that I must have that y prime is equal to zero. So let's see if these solutions actually give me what I want. I'm in particular concerned about the fact that I do have a bottom here, and these points might actually result in my denominator being zero as well, so I have to be a little bit more careful. So if I have x equals to zero, and I plug this in here, I am going to, of course, end up with zero on the top and 2y on the bottom. In order to calculate my y, I need to go back to my function value and see what it equals to there. So if my x is equal to 0, what am I going to have in terms of my y? If I plug it in here, I'm going to get 0 cubed plus 0 squared. So y squared is equal to 0, which will imply y is equal to 0. And so if I plug these two values in for my expression, for the derivative, I'm going to get 0 over 0, which of course is not great. That means that the derivative at, at this point is actually undefined. If I plug in x equals minus 2 thirds, I'm going to get some expression for y squared that isn't equal to 0. So I know that I am in no trouble at all with plugging this into my derivative expression. So that means that the tangent is horizontal only at this particular point. Okay, so let's write that as a conclusion. Tangent line is horizontal only at 
x equals negative 2 thirds. And now, what I would like to do, because that's not the information I have on this page, is justify how else could I have thought of having to plug this back in in order to make sure that everything works out okay. And the idea here is I am given the graph of my function. So what I can actually do at this point is simply consult my graph. So remember the points 0 and minus 2 thirds. Let's go back to our graph. What do I have? I have 0 here and I have minus 2 thirds. So somewhere, let's say, out here, right? And I claim that at those two points is when my derivative is potentially 0. So I am looking for the slope of the tangent line. Let me mark this here. So that would correspond to two different points on the graph. And I can, of course, see that if I draw a tangent line, that does look pretty horizontal to me right here. However, the issue, of course, with 0 here is the function here is not differentiable at all, really. Because which way do I draw my tangent? This way or this way? If I cannot draw a unique tangent line, if I have some sort of a cusp, then that means that my function here is not differentiable. So the point x equals 0, y equals 0 that I got as a result of my calculations is going to be problematic in every single calculation I do. And that is something that is quite useful to remember here. Okay, so let's go back and do the next part of our question, which is requiring for the tangent to be vertical, which means that I'm looking for where my derivative does not exist. So here, let's use the graph as motivation at first. I am looking for when my derivative tends to infinity, right? I need to have a vertical tangent line. So my derivative or my slope is actually not just not existing, but more specifically equaling to either plus infinity or minus infinity. By purely inspecting the graph, I can see that this happens at this point right here. But of course, by inspection isn't exact. This might very well be an approximation. What if I zoom into this graph and this does not prove to be the actual point where the graph is flat in this particular way? I need to figure out how to do this using my algebra tools. So here we have our expression for the derivative. Again, remember that for this part, what we would like is vertical tangent, which of course means that our derivative is approaching infinity. So I'm going to write it a little bit more precisely than on the previous slide. Not just not existing, but more specifically not existing in the sense of it has to approach infinity. This is the expression for my derivative. This is really just a rational function with the top and the bottom. Remember, we discussed how with rational functions, approaching infinity or having a vertical asymptote means that this is something where the denominator is going to be zero. Here, my denominator is very simple, 2y. So this would imply that I am looking at the case where y is equal to zero. Now, once I have that, I need to go back through the same type of uh, analysis as I did for this part here. I need to look back onto my function because that is what connects x and y directly. And I will see that y is equaling to 0 implies that x cubed plus x squared is equal to 0. I can factor out here. Again, remember, don't divide factor. So I can take out x squared. I will have x plus 1 left. And once again, factoring is useful because it gives me a way to split up my information here. So either x squared is 0, which means that x is 0, or this bracket is 0, which will imply x is equal to negative 1. Remembering what the graph looks like, this actually looks quite consistent with what we've seen so far. right? So at this point again, if you were doing this purely algebraically to begin with, consulting the graph is likely a very smart idea. We will then see that x equaling 0 does not correspond to a vertical tangent in the exact same way that it did not correspond to a horizontal tangent before, because simply at that point, the function is not differentiable. So at x equals 0, I can just write it down using um, different wording now for a little bit of variety. The function is not differentiable altogether. So that means that there is no tangent line at all. Another way to think about this algebraically is to actually consider the limit 
of my derivative value y prime as x approaches 0. And we can, in fact, calculate that. So if I have this expression, just again thinking about what is the uh, value of the derivative near 0. Okay, so let's plug in the actual expression for y prime, which is this guy right here. So 3x squared plus 2x over 2y. And now I can actually, um, for these calculations, I would like my entire limit in terms of x. So I'm going to replace y with uh, what I can solve for it to be here. So this would be plus or minus 2 square root of x cubed plus x squared. Now this looks like a pretty... Um, pretty big limit and it might not be immediately obvious what are the different ways to approach it. However, we can, as always, think about the most useful method to analyze functions that only involve more or less polynomials or just powers using the near the origin and end behavior or power analysis. I'm not going to go through the steps, but if you go through the power analysis here, this corresponds to the fact that the values of x are small, which means that the smaller powers will dominate. So we will be looking at the smaller powers, not forgetting the coefficients and the square root. We will end up with two different values for this limit, which will be plus and minus 1. So that means that near 0, the value of the derivative is either plus or minus 1, depending on which branch of your now explicitly defined function you take. Going back to the graph, this actually corresponds to what we're seeing. If I approach my 0 along one of the branches of the function, my tangent is going to have a positive slope, and apparently this is a positive slope of 1. And if I approach it from the other side, my graph is going to have a negative 1 as the slope of the tangent line which of course, once again, means that at this point, I cannot decide between the two, so the function is not differentiable. So altogether, this once again discards our x equals 0 as a potential for a vertical tangent, which means that um, the tangent line is only vertical at one point, and that specific point is x equaling negative 1, which then, of course, once again, confirms the intuition that we're seeing from the graph. And for part four, it's asking very specifically, is this function differentiable at zero or is it not? Explain why or why not using the graph or the formula, okay? Because this was actually part of the question from the midterm, um, it gave freedom to use either the graphical or the formulaic approach. We're doing this as a part of the lecture, I would ask you to actually explain it using both. So you have flexibility in working with the concept. This is already something that I've done in the previous parts, so I will leave the full write-out for number four to you because it is in many ways already present in the various information that we have gone through in parts one through three. Let's take a look at this next example, the body mass index. The formula for the body mass index is very simple. It is the mass in kilograms divided by the square of the height in meters. There is a lot of different types of justifications that go into this and showing that there are many reasons why BMI is not a very good indication of actual body mass um, being big or being small. But leaving that aside and seeing that we would like to actually analyze this formula, let's take a look at some of the other information that we're given. So I decide after eating all of the baked goods that students bring to me that I should probably lose some weight. My current weight is 55 kilograms and my height is 1.5 meters. I am pretty short. I start losing weight at the rate of 0.2 kilograms per month. So we already notice that this being the rate and looking at the units is a derivative where the top is kilograms. So this would be mass per month, the bottom being the time. So even without really thinking about what else I have here, I immediately can write down 
that this value is the derivative of mass with respect to time. I have to be a little bit careful because it is corresponding to the decrease in weight. So when being written in terms of the derivative, the actual value has to be negative. The question asks, how fast is my BMI changing? Here, once again, we're actually given the formula for the thing that we're considering. So we can take this directly and integrate it with respect to the actual um, variable that is changing. Here, we notice that my weight is changing with time. So we are going to be taking the derivative with respect to time. So let's start off by writing our formula. So that is m divided by h squared. And I would like to take a derivative of this with respect to time. Now, there are a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, first of all, of course, you can notice that it is a quotient, so you can apply a quotient rule. Um, but I like to avoid quotient rule if I can. So what I am going to do is I'm actually going to rewrite this as a product. To me, this is m times h to power negative 2. Right? In fact, any product, any quotient can be rewritten as product. In sketching questions that we will see later on, um, this approach doesn't seem to be necessarily useful because of the analysis that we have to put into the derivative afterwards. But in a word problem, um, I find that turning a quotient into a product results in fewer algebraic steps to be taken. Because now, if in the first step what I had to consider was quotient rule, then in the second step, once I turn it into a product, I have to consider product rule, which is, again, to me, a little bit more straightforward algebraically. So the product rule says that I take a derivative of the first uh, part and leave the second part alone, plus I leave the first part alone and take a derivative of the second portion. Now, here, I have to be careful at every single step. So when I'm taking the derivative of the first part, there is no inside and outside. There's just m. But once I have to think about taking the derivative of h to the minus 2, now I have myself a power rule that I will have to apply. And then I have to think of the inside of that function. So in this case, I have to first apply the power rule and then follow it up chain rule or in a sense of um, implicit differentiation dh by dt. Now that I've taken all of the derivatives, I am going to collect the information that I know and plug those numbers into here. So what do I have? I know that my dm by dt is minus 0.2. I know that my h, my height, is 1.5 meters. So here it's going to be 1.5 to the negative 2, if I plug this in, right? I know that my current mass is 55 kilograms. Again, my h value here is still 1.5. And now the only real thing I have to think about that I don't have written out explicitly yet is dh by dt. Now let's think about what is this value corresponding to. dh by dt, it's a derivative, which means it's the rate of change. h is my height, t is time. It's the rate of change of my height with respect to time during this process as described. Now, losing weight is going to make me lose weight, fat, muscle, whatever, but it's certainly not going to make me lose my height or gain any, really. So this expression is simply equal to zero. Now, that means that I don't actually have to multiply these two numbers together either. This entire thing is going to be equal to zero. So if I plug in all of the numbers as written, what I'm going to get is minus 0 0.09. So I notice that overall I end up with a negative number, which of course means that my BMI is decreasing. Okay, now one more thing that you can do here is try a different approach sort of from the beginning, but you have to be a little bit careful about this. In the beginning, the formula is given to us as m over h squared. My mass is going to be changing. And in fact, the rate of change is given. But you could have realized from the very beginning that my height is going to stay constant throughout the entire pro process. So that means that I can plug this 1.5 in for h right away and then actually work with a formula. So the alternative approach would have been to notice 
that my actual BMI, to begin with, can be written as m over 1.5 squared, which really means it's a constant, 1 over 1 1.5 squared times m, and I can take a derivative of just that directly. Okay, This is going to be a little bit easier because you're not going to end up with secondary derivatives of all the functions, but it is something that you have to think about carefully right away. What is changing, which is the mass, and what stays constant and can be replaced with a specific value right away. Next example is actually going to require a setup. So as you read through already, just at a glance, we notice that we're given no formulas whatsoever, which means that we're going to have to come up with a formula to describe the relationship between the variables that we're working with. So here I have a canister of oil, and it is forming an oil stick around itself in an ocean. So a ship dropped a canister of oil, and the oil is continuing, the oil stick is continuing to grow. So what is happening is that the spill is circular and it is expanding. We know that when the radius is 3 meters, it is growing at the rate of 2 centimeters per second. We are wondering at what rate the area of this spill is expanding. So let's draw ourselves a nice little circle for our oil spill. So this is what we have here, and we know that the radius of this thing, let's give it a name, R, is growing. What is it that we are given in terms of the information here? I know that when the radius is 3 meters, so when R is equal to 3 meters, I have that the rate of it is growing at 2 centimeters per second. So my first thing to notice here is that my units of measure are not exactly the same. So I am going to have to be careful about transforming into either meters or centimeters. And it is completely up to you. Let's say that I decide to go with centimeters. So that means that when the radius is 300 centimeters, it is growing. So the rate of growth of it is equal to 2 centimeters per second. Again, different people think about how to describe this differently. It might be the units that tell you what the fact that this we're talking about the derivative, or it might be the word rate. Um, but regardless of that, the growth should indicate to you that the entire value is, of course, positive. This is the information that we're given, what it is that we want. We would like to know at what rate, so the derivative, is the area of this spill expanding. Now, we don't have a uh, variable for the area yet, so let's call it A, the rate, the derivative, with respect to time. Now, the information we're given tells us something about the value of R and the value of the derivative of R. The information that we want is in terms of A. So the first thing that we need is to come up with a relationship between A and R. Okay, so let's write that down so we remember. We need to come up with a relationship between A and R. Now, what is the other piece of information that we haven't used from the actual description of the situation? We haven't used the fact yet that the spill is actually circular. I mean, we've used it to use the radius, but this is another thing that we can use to come up with a relationship between the area of a circle and its radius. This is, of course, just a straightforward area is equal to pi r squared formula. And now that I have that, my setup part of the problem is done. I noticed that I would like a derivative of this with respect to time. So I'm going to take the derivative of this expression with respect to time on both left and right. On the right here, I have to pause for a second and think. Pi is a constant. So in order for me to take a derivative of pi r squared, I am going to leave pi alone and then take a derivative of r squared. For r squared, first of all, I noticed that there is an outside function square, so I'm going to have to apply the power rule first. And then I need to deal with the fact that r inside is also a function of time, and it is in fact changing with respect to time. So I have to follow this up 
by the derivative of the inside, so dr by dt. And once I have that, of course, I can simply plug in the values. So r is equal to 300, and dr by dt is equal to 2. So altogether, if I calculate this, I'm going to come up with, I believe, 1200 pi, and the units now have to be the corresponding to the area on top, so centimeters squared, and the time on the bottom per second. You can, of course, go right ahead and plug pi in as well to figure out what the total number is. I'm going to leave it as that. Pi is a perfectly um, fine constant as far as I'm concerned, so this is my answer. I can also notice, of course, that this is going to be positive, which confirms my intuition that as the radius is growing, the area is growing as well. Let's take a look at another example here. Frosty the snowman. Might be a little too early for snow, um, but we are preparing to build our snowman. Uh, Frosty the snowman is made out of three identical spherical balls. Okay, not your standard classical construction, but I'm going to have three identical spherical balls. I'm going to copy them over to make sure that they're actually identical, and they're going to be sitting on top of each other. There is my Frosty. Each ball is originally of radius 18 centimeters, but each one is shrinking, melting, in radius uh, at the rate of 2 centimeters per hour. The first question is asking what is Frosty's original volume? Next is asking how fast is its volume changing when the head is 10 centimeters in radius? Now notice that the balls are of course all the same size, so that means that any one of the three is 10 centimeters in radius. And how long will it take for Frosty to melt completely? Pause the video here. Now that I have even drawn the picture of Frosty for you, there should be no question about what the setup is, and you should be able to go through these questions by yourself. Okay, so what we have is three identical balls. So let's give them the radius r. What we are also given is the fact that their radius is shrinking at the rate of 2 centimeters per hour. So minus 2 centimeters per hour. The first part is asking what is Frosty's original volume? Okay, so original volume is going to be what the size was when the before the melting process has started. Now here I have three different balls. What is the volume of either one of them? If I give you the radius of a, of a ball or a sphere, what is the volume? So you can look this up. You will notice that the volume of one sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. But I have three of them, so I have to multiply the volume of one sphere by three. Now I also know that at the beginning the radius is 18 centimeters, so I can replace my radius here with 18. So with the radius being 18, I can plug this in and get a number, which according to my calculations comes out to be 73,250, and the units are going to be centimeters cubed. Next, we are wondering how fast is the volume changing when the radius of the ball, any one of them really, here it says the head, is 10 centimeters in radius. So the rate of change of volume is what we're after when the radius is equal to 10. Be careful, you don't want to plug this into the formula for the volume first, because if you plug in the radius size first, you'll end up with the constant number overall, and if you take a derivative, of course, it's just going to be zero. So what I need to do is, first of all, take a derivative, and then plug in the number. So first, let me just rewrite the expression for the volume. I didn't have to simplify it in the first portion, because I was just plugging in numbers, but it might makes sense to simplify this a little bit before I take a derivative. You notice that the threes cancel out and I end up with four pi r cubed. Now, if I take a derivative of this with respect to time, because of course Frosty is melting with respect to time, on the left-hand side here for the volume, I will have the derivative of the volume with respect to time. And on the right-hand side, I need to take a derivative of four pi r cubed.
And now this is actually quite similar to the previous example about the oil slick, because I have 4 pi that is a constant, so I will leave it alone. And then I need to take a derivative of r cubed. I have my outside function cube. So first I apply the power rule, and then I have to follow up by the derivative of the inside or my changing radius. So now I can plug in numbers because I'm done taking derivatives. I am interested in the situation when the radius is 3, and I know that my snowman is melting at the rate of negative 2 centimeters per hour. Plugging all of this in, I will end up with, I've calculated the number including the value for pi, minus 7,536. Now it's the volume units, centimeters cubed, per time unit, which is an hour. Notice that here I can do common sense check again. The volume of the entire structure is decreasing, which means that I should expect a negative answer, and if I didn't get one, then I would be slightly concerned. And the final question, how long will it take for Frosty to melt completely? This one is a little bit tricky because it's actually very straightforward. This almost involves no calculus at all. Notice that I start with the radius of each ball at 18 centimeters, and it is melting at the rate of 2 centimeters per hour. My starting value is 18 centimeters, and it's shrinking at 2 centimeters per hour. How long will it take until my entire radius is gone? Well, if the radius starts off at 18, and it's shrinking at 2 centimeters every single hour, it means that in an hour I will have 16, in one more hour I will have 14, 12, and so on and so forth. So this doesn't actually take very um, hard or anything really mathematical um, thinking. It literally just takes logical thinking. So write this out, figure out how many hours you have your snowman alive for. Now for this last question, I'm actually going to leave the setup to you. The question is a, a bit of a standard one in terms of a real setup and is going to be an easier, much easier version of the Elvis question. We have uh, Amanda and Brent Brendan breaking up on an island and leaving the island at the same time. Amanda's boat is traveling north, so let's say this is their Maui location. Amanda is traveling north. Brendan is traveling west, and the question asks, how fast is the distance between the two changing? Okay, I have full faith that you are able to set this up and go through the calculations yourself, given how much practice we've already have with this kind of thing. You have a triangle. Remember the question about the spider from the previous uh, lecture, as well as the Elvis question from this one, to inspire yourself to what kinds of formulas you know about triangles, particularly right angle triangles.